Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Zaz, <clears throat> I'm responding both to your remarks yesterday in the panels and your remarks today because I'm still unclear about one point. And that is uh, demonstrated by this. What do you, how do you conceptualize the treatment of a voluntary patient who's been labeled manic depressive and fits all the criteria with lithium and who responds successfully to lithium in that both the patient and family and all other observers agree that they respond? I will give you an answer and you will dislike me even more when I get through. <laughs> I appreciate your defending rights and your pointing out abuses. I, I'm not disliking you, but I am very confused about No, no. Point. You are going to dislike me because you are implying that this somehow proves something, and maybe it proves something to you. To me, it proves nothing. I have said it before. I don't want to repeat myself. I didn't say it this afternoon. I am not anti-psychiatry. I'm not disparaging anything. I am a fervent advocate of psychiatry between consenting adults. And between consenting adults, everything works and nothing works. How do you explain that when two people are in love and marry each other, they feel wonderful for a few weeks or a few months, and then they're miserable? How do you explain that when a businessman, how do you explain that Freud felt so wonderful by smoking all his life? But why isn't smoking a therapy? The fact that you take someone who doesn't feel well and then he takes some drugs and, so, and then he feels better is anecdotal. To me, anecdote is the opposite of science. I don't pretend to do science here, but anecdotes are anecdotes. Whether it's told about lithium or by Lang or anybody else. There are stories. When you want to find a disease in the brain, I'll be the first one to say this is a disease. And then we'll have the same problems we had before, morally. So I don't have an explanation for it. It goes without saying that I do not pretend to believe myself or to think that every biochemical or structural thing that can go wrong with a human brain is already known today by scientists. Medicine is a very new science. So there are undiscovered brain diseases. So what? So then they'll discover another brain disease. Right. Okay, do you conceptualize that condition as a disease in that case? Of course not. I only conceptualize this. That's why I showed you the chart. To me, there are no diseases until they appear in, let me be very, I like to do this in medical schools, you know, the psychiatrists always talk about diseases. Well, you can go to, are you a doctor? Yes. Well, why don't you go to, a, you know Robbins' textbook of pathology, that's the one that's used in, by medical schools now, Robbins and two other people. Well, 2,000 pages. If you show me schizophrenia in there, and manic depression, then I'll buy it. It's not in the book. Do you hear me? It's not in the book. Down syndrome is in there. Kleinfelter syndrome is in there. You know, I know my medicine. It's not in the book. Only psychiatrists claim that this is a dopamine disease. There are now libraries full of metabolic diseases. Not one of them mentions psychiatric diseases. You know what these are? Psychiatric stories, fables, or as I prefer to call them, out and out lies. Lies like lobotomy for which the inventor got a Nobel Prize. If the Nobel Committee can be fooled that much, we are talking about huge, huge human follies, like three-fifths human beings. With intent? With intent? With intent? Of course. Everybody has intent. Conscious and intent? As far as I am concerned, everybody has intent until proven otherwise. I do That's have a, a request of you, Dr. Zaz. Since you are so firm that there are no such things as mental diseases, I wish you would also be a little bit more critical of the medical profession, which continues to treat people with unnecessary surgery and unnecessary medical procedures and invents diseases that are not proven any more than manic depressive disease. I don't think psychiatry is any worse off, really, than most of internal now look, medicine. Look, now you have made a point. I. But look, who do you think I cut my eye teeth on? Moliere, Voltaire. Every profession, George Bernard Shaw said it all, much better than you and I could. George Bernard Shaw said in his introduction to uh, A Doctor's Dilemma, it's quite, used to be quite often quoted, it's not so popular, he said, every profession is a conspiracy against the public. <laughs> And you know which is the number one profession? Law. You, kn 
You, it's in one of Shakespeare's plays where somebody says, well, if we're going to have a decent society, first of all, we must go out and kill all the lawyers. <laughs> so what that, what that gentleman said is absolutely true. But you see, what you are saying is a little bit like telling me, I like to compare myself to an abolitionist, let's say like someone like, like Ralph Waldo Emerson. It would be like saying, well, Ralph, why, why do you keep talking so much about the slaveholders in the South? Why don't you talk about the terrible things going on in China? Or in Hungary. Well, this is what I talk about. You are quite right. The medicine profession, the history of medicine is full of this kind of BS, finding non-existent diseases, taking out uteruses, tonsils, this and that. Of course. No, no profession, no group. There's, there's no specially elect group. The danger, you see, is that the medical profession though, is now looked upon as a specially elect group. That's why I mentioned the EMA being ad involved in tobacco advertising. They have somehow become recognized as the protectors of our spiritual well-being, like the clergy used, instead of as a special interest group. They are simply another special interest group.